I work with external stakeholders uh, all day long and on the weekends uh, through the citizen monitoring program. But I also work with everybody else who wants to call because they have a complaint or something because they see the word citizen. And so some of those complaints come in from the general public, sometimes from regulated community. I get everything down in LA ringing on my phone. So, so if you could uh, let everybody know who you are and the uh, community that you represent. Okay, I'm uh, Ryan Janik. I'm one of the founders of Mapistry. It's a software company that provides environmental compliance software largely to industrial facilities. I uh, work a lot with Smarts Data and the Industrial Stormwater Permit. I'm Tony Hale. I'm Program Director for Environmental Informatics at the San Francisco Estuary Institute Aquatic Science Center. We are a nonprofit and a joint powers authority, or JPA, um, comprising the State Water Board and the uh, uh, Bay Area uh, Clean Water Association. We um, we pursue our mission is to pursue um, the uh, clean water uh, throughout California, but especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and we work with the Water Board um, quite a lot on a number of different projects. Um, we're just going through a simple introduction now, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of end it there. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Dorn. I'm an Environmental Program Manager with the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, and to make that short, we're known as Regional San. We're the uh, local wastewater treatment plant and sewer system folks. I work in their legislative and regulatory affairs section. So that gives me, I think, kind of a little different perspective on um, how to use data out of these databases. I've actually also worked on the regulatory side. I've been with the regional SAM for 10 years. I also worked as a regulator for the state board, the San Francisco Bay Regional Board, and Santa Clara Valley Water District. So my involvement with databases in this area kind of goes back a few decades. And um, I, my direct interaction with databases and the ones from the state board in particular is kind of limited, actually, in the in the role that I have for myself right now. And I I'd also uh, have another perspective from the Central Valley. I work with the Central Valley Clean Water Association on their water committee. I'm a chair of that water committee. So there's been some interaction with trying to extract the data from it. But before I came here, I went around internally because I wanted to know from our own organization, you know, how, how do you use CWIX? And the main response I got was, we feed CWIX. <laughs> so um, so I, I guess I'll have a little different perspective. And I don't know if you have specific questions for us or if you just want us to well, I think go on. Well, into the, the big question, and I have two big ones, is what, what are you guys doing with data, either your own or other people's data, and then your, your wishes, what would you like to what would help you do your job, you know, serve your community? You know, what questions are of interest to you that can be answered by, by technology that exists today? So I'll um, take, take a stab at how using the data specifically and uh, go to one of the projects that we've been working on with the uh, CIVICWA, the Central Valley Clean Water Association, the Water Committee, and that's working with toxicity and uh, our Central Valley Regional Board staff. So we wanted to have a good idea of what kind of toxicity violations were occurring, and of course we went to CWICS, well, had a consultant um, go to CWICS for us and, and put that information together. And it was useful right, for getting a snapshot of what kind of toxicity hits are occurring uh, from POTWs in the Central Valley. So I'd say that's one direct way recently that uh, I've worked with the data that's in the database. Uh, down at the organizational level, though, again, there's not much use that we've had for extracting data and trying to use that. I mean, I guess when um, the sanitary sewer system uh, permit first came in place and people started reporting their SSOs, so we took a look, you know, to just kind of see what was going on through the state. So it's kind of been hit and miss with different parts of the um, CWIX database and nothing that you use on a consistent um, basis. 
So, and of course, if I'm just speaking here from kind of the Central Valley and uh, regional SANS perspective, if you spoke with folks from Southern California, you probably would have a different answer. Um, or to regional monitoring program, and that's a fairly new program. I'm one of the co-chairs along with uh, Adam Lappitz, the executive officer of the regional board. And we have started collecting data in that program uh, last year. And that will actually be reported through SEDEN. So I'll be, everyone that's a stakeholder effort and uh, involving irrigated ag, stormwater, um, water supply, is also in there you know, for the for the Delta. So it will be interesting to see how that data comes through Seeden and is actually used amongst the various stakeholders, but that's kind of that's in the future. We we'll just have one year's worth of data right now and uh, looking at um, overall it will be nutrients, pesticides slash toxicity and uh, mercury, methyl mercury, and then pathogens. So that's that's one way. But I, um, John Marshak, I think, brought up kind of this idea of the integration across the data. You know, being able to put the receiving water along with regulated entities. Um, I would I would say even probably some of the information from the water rights once you get flow information in there would be like my um, dream of the future to be able to truly get a snapshot on water quality and supply at the same time throughout uh, California. And I believe, it's my own personal belief, that in the water quality realm, which I've spent a lot more time working in than uh, water supply, that we very well might find that things are better than what you think they are. It's just that you have not been able to integrate the information to truly see the uh, whole picture that's out there. So, so all the dots and the color are there. Uh, coloring is very good. Yeah, it, yeah, it makes your brain work. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, I think it's actually. Oh, uh, there is a question. question. Well, uh, a comment I could share to add a little bit to that. So two things that connect to you and Tony sitting around beside each other. Of course, the Delta Regional Monitoring Program and data goes into what is it, CD3 as well as a regional data center and CDN. So there's a, a long process for uploading data and having it visualized in different ways. So people can access the CDN and visualize anyway, or we see three things that you should have mentioned. The other one is um, uh, this morning, maybe it was, I don't remember, Greg or somebody had pointed out that uh, the, the legacy data that's on paper or whatever, there's another type of data that's sort of legacy and not available yet, was like the CMP that the regional science department, mm -hmm. right? So they collected data around here in the major rivers, had it in their own internal database, but it wasn't in CDN. But now there's funds that's doing that, and so this group is doing that. Yeah. And uh, Stephen McCord is the uh, chair, uh, well, co-chair of the Technical Advisory Committee for the Delta Regional Monitoring Program. So I'm sure there's some orphan data sets out there as well that people just lost. I, well, I didn't even touch on our own internal data that we have. <laughs> I think that is a good segue. So we, uh, at SABI, we do administer the, the Delta Regional Monitoring Program as well as the San Francisco Bay Regional Monitoring Program. So um, those data that you that you cited that we have one year's worth, it's mm -hmm. sitting in review right now. And then once they're, they've been a, a reviewed and approved, then they will be made public. They'll be made public, as Steve pointed out, through the Contaminant Data Display Download Tool, or CD3. They will make their way into Seeden, and then they, you will also find them in uh, tools like the um, like Bay Delta Live Estuaries Work Group. Um, so that's going to be really exciting as well. So one of the things that I always like to say is that um, data is forever, and tools change. And so it's really important to understand that we're now entering a new era of that principle being expanded even further where, you know, we need to be really rigorous with how we process the data and how we ensure that the data maintains its integrity um, and the, stand, the standards that you're putting into place at the, at the, the Delta Regional Monitoring Program are so important for that. Um, documenting it through metadata and, you know, all the data standards you set up. But then 
now we're entering an era where those data are going to be replicated in all different ways and all different places dynamically. So, you know, uh, we really look forward to the to the time when when Seedon um, pushing up in, into CWIX and I mean, I mean in the WQX, the EPA's WQX also has has more dynamic web services. Learning from that experience, and more dynamic web services to bring it out to even more systems because uh, you know I, one of the the things when you're talking about like what we most need. Um, I, I was an editor on a paper uh, conducted under the Delta Stewardship Council called Enhancing the Vision for Managing California's Environmental Information. And one of the things that emerged from that were a series of recommendations. And I think as we talk about open data, we, we, we're, we're, we're establishing standards for, for data, for metadata, um, for data interchange. But it seems that really we need to have a very clear understanding of, of a kind of what is a, a minimum standard for what, we calling, what we're calling open data, you know, because that's what has changed most over the years is that what used to qualify as open data would be an email address, you know, just email me and I'll send you the data and then it was a link to download the data and then, you know, forms to filter the data. And now it's more getting to the level of system-to-system -system interoperability so that you can more dynamically get, get current and timely data. And we're working with the State Water Resources Control Board on a, on a system that I think will, um, will be really, really helpful. It's this freshwater harmful algal bloom visualization. And, and I know, Eric, you're, you're really keen to see this get, get off the ground, but it's a way to visualize the satellite data, blending that with seed in data, you know, and that's really critical to bring that into focus. But I think what it's also going to do is to point out holes in the, in the data, what we need to fill by either having more timely information coming through or, or doing even more robust data collection. Um, so part of, part of opening up data is being able to see kind of where those holes are and, and then allocating resources to fill those holes in, in various ways. So thank you. Yeah, so my interaction has largely been through SMARTS. Uh, we provide software to industrial facilities, and as part of that, we've taken SMARTS data and use it to speed up their permitting processing for filing under the general permit. So the big thing we hear from our user groups is make it easier to file my permits. You know, I've got a requirement to file these stormwater permits, make it as easy as possible. Um, so from the uh, water board or SMARTS perspective is easier user interfaces, um, user experience, uh, ability to pay. We hear a lot of stories of facilities not filing their permits because they get partway through the system and they're not used to doing this and it's too difficult and they just drop off and they never even file the permit to begin with. So making it as easy as possible, um, frictionless as possible, and then making it easy to pay so they understand that they've completed the whole process. There's numbers of facilities out there that are, you know, deficient in their permits because they never actually paid and they have never realized they needed to or they didn't get the invoice. So if technology can do this. You can check out on Amazon. You know, being able to check out with your permit would help a lot of these smaller facilities file their permits. And then the second piece is that integration piece is what we really see as the next step is having two-way integration the same way as many people file their taxes every year. If you use TurboTax or some other method at the end, you just submit it to the state. These permits have requirements for facilities to file all these annual reports or um, after sampling data, et cetera. If we have two-way integration, we can make it easy to have it on their own systems to be able to say done and it just automatically goes into the state website. That way they can track it internally on their own systems but still comply with the permits and submit it. So going that way of having APIs, having uh, two-way syncs between the state databases and external providers. Are there headaches that you have dealing with, with the state and, and its data and how it's being housed right now and how we're delivering it? Um, what, what could be done so that we can help you guys have access to our data much better, make it you know, more fluid? Um, just, I'm sure you have some stories you could you could share. We could come up with some solutions for. I, I, I'll kick it off. Sure. So um, one of the things I, I haven't yet mentioned is that I'm, I'm co-chair of the data management work group, which is a work group within the uh, California Water Quality Monitoring Council family of work groups, and we think a lot about how to make data sharing better, easier. 
um, strategize about that. And uh, so I, I want actually this is just an advertisement, uh, bald-faced advertisement, to welcome anybody who's interested in, in helping to tackle those questions um, to, to come on board and, and join us. Uh, we meet every other month, um, and, and you can see me for more details. But um, really, uh, I think that, that one of the, the, the ways to, to, to kind of uh, to, to address the problems is to um, pursue data federation, and, um, and so, so part of that might be addressed through Socrata, and um, through uh, a number of different platforms that are being uh, proposed, um, but it's it's I think it's really important to uh, to define what we mean by data federation and to um, and and to make sure that we're we're kind of fulfilling the, the the promise of that. Even if we're taking incremental steps towards something more robust, it, I think it's important that we don't set our sights too low. Thank you. Uh, well, I know over the years that there has been uh, a lot of changes and my understanding is from inputting the data and again I'm going to talk more from an input because um, as I explained at least for our organization that there really isn't uh, much extraction that, that we do out of the data systems and uh, but today I'd say communication is is key like today it was just pointed out to me that the some of the fields from CEDEN have been added to CWIX uh, and the folks that have to put the data in it didn't know it was going to happen and then things come up and you're like you don't uh, understand what you're even supposed to do with that because there wasn't any communication about it actually being there and how to populate it. Um, I, I guess just to get specific I was think we were talking about it over lunch and one was like lab batch number and so you know, now that now I guess that has to be put in. So I'd say that when there are going to be changes made and kind of global things to make the databases talk amongst themselves better, that it would be good to have some form of communication so that it just doesn't show up. Um, another thing that I know is coming down the line, and I think CWIX has done a, a fairly good job of it, is dealing with the DMR reports and uh, US EPA's requirements for uh, information on DMRs. And I think biosolids uh, information is coming up to be re uh, required to put into EPA's database. And again, I'm not the database entry type person, so I don't know exactly how that's going to happen and need to do more work and research on it. But if there's, you know, one database that you can deal with rather than having to put your information in multiple places, uh, at least by as a facility perspective, that, that's very helpful. And um, my, my understanding, again, is that CWIX has gotten better at it. And I guess when I was also inquiring internally, one of the places that we are putting information with the uh, WDR that we have for solids is into GeoTracker. And the person that I spoke with said that they they haven't really used it, but they actually like the fact that in GeoTracker you could uh, spatially do things with the data if you wanted to, but um, they weren't sure what they would be doing. <laughs> so, uh, that's my response. Sure, wonderful words for us. Yeah, well, besides the ease of use in the 2A integration is more from just a facility or end user is understanding what's going on with the data. Um, it's a little bit on that communication, but just combining how their specific facility permitted um, relates to others, how they're doing in comparison to their neighbors, maybe the state as a whole. Um, we've had some external reporting from State Water Board on this is what the stormwater sampling data is to date, but if there's a way the public and the facilities can engage that on a more regular basis, that real-time basis, I think it would help on understanding. Um, one of the things uh, for industrial facilities, especially the people out on the facility, helping them understand how it impacts them at home, um, why they need to care about protecting water quality because they live downstream from these facilities. So really understanding that, tying facility data into GIS or TMDLs or 303D water bodies um, because I think for a lot of these um, individuals on, in production roles, uh, manufacturing roles, they don't, they're disconnected from it. Um, so from an education training standpoint, it would be really good for them to see how this is impacting where they hunt, where they fish, where they take their families on the weekends. Uh, it would help go away towards getting them on board with complying with water quality um, criteria in a permit if they can see that. So communication, federation, unification. <laughs> okay. You all heard that, right? 
It's easy, right? You can put that on me. Do you have a comment in the back? Yeah, it's a good comment. I, I work with lots of different groups, and they communicate with lots of labs, and each lab <coughs> sends them different. Everything's different. Yeah. Uh, of That's my headache. Yes. Yeah. Combinations alone, um, CIMICS, for example, CIMICS, um, part of the success of CIMICS, and I think CIMICS is a success. You know, we have these sort of group meetings, students from the get go, and there were, there were pilot studies that was done. However, again, there were databases already existing before it, and therefore those laboratories and those dischargers need to do a mapping, mapping um, formulation so it matches the series of them. Now that I'm also getting my hands in my year for this period in the season, I'm noticing that they're also calling, supposed to be calling the same thing same, but it's different. So now we have three different conversions we have to do. Let alone methods are changing all the time. Method version, method update rules, these are all changing. If your database is stuck five years ago, the same parameter you're looking for is now using a different method. Therefore, what I'm entering in your data doesn't really affect the method I'm using, but you're stuck with the method you inputted five years ago. Any impressions from the panel? Uh, we've run into that same problem, taking lab data. It would be great if a LIM system can push it out in the same format that can go directly into SMARTS, or a laboratory can pull with those method number IDs so they're all the same. If they're pulling from the same central repository, everybody would have the same identifier, and it wouldn't be any question. Uh, it would also make it easier for the permittees if they just go to any lab in the state that's uh, certified and they know they're going to have the right method number. You know, the lab's going to flag it saying, hey, you should analyze for this method number because this is what the state has said. Uh, it would make everybody's job a lot easier. Okay. I, I, have to, I have to code it when I really got it. And I think it's fair because it's not the same. So there was an entire I had to spend coding my census. It's like matches the, the naming convention. It should be a two-way sync with you know a central state naming convention that you're always looking at that central for the the correct naming convention and if it if it changes to flag it or adjust it rather than having to go back in every five years and check them and on the fly check them and change them conversion and redefinition and there's a lot of connection and that's that it's making it's making it hard for us to actually provide the data. Yeah. To make to do it efficiently. One one instrument that I'm that within the data management work group we're we're trying to tackle is um, how to develop uh, a a statewide standard for data management plans. And um, there are data management plans in use, I'm sure, in various agencies and probably various divisions within the agencies. Um, but it seems to me that, that one thing that a data management plan helps to do, particularly if it's developed kind of inter, in an interagency fashion, that it will help to build common definitions, common, de common understandings, and can at least pave the way towards, 
towards the kind of uh, vision that you have for uh, kind of single definitions for these kinds of things. It's not going to be a panacea, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. And, um, and so that, that's one of the things we would hope could be developed in, in the coming years, and that will help greatly with open data. It's something that should be developed at the start of a project, not at the end of a project, because it can even help influence data collection methods as well as you know, where you're going to be submitting the data and things like that.